Once again, welcome to the spring 2015 installment of the Trinity Debates on the campus of Trinity International University. We're delighted that you're here with us this evening, both in person here at the historic and handsome and heated ATO Olson Chapel on the campus of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and online watching on our streaming website uh, sponsored by the Carl F.H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding. I do not know uh, if everybody online can see, but we have a good turnout here tonight. No doubt this is due in large part to our two fine participants, Drs. Douglas Campbell and Doug, Douglas Moo, who will be, uh, I will be introducing in a moment. It's also due in large part, I think, to the debate topic, which is so central to the life of the church. Is a Lutheran approach to Pauline justification justified? Dr. Mu will answer yes. A Lutheran approach to Pauline justification is justified. Dr. Campbell will answer no. This approach is not justified. Tonight's debate, uh, Trinity Debate installment, is sponsored by the Henry Center for Theological Understanding. They would like me to let you know that they'd love for you to stay connected with them, sign up for the newsletter, and uh, follow along with what uh, the Henry Center is doing. I am Dr. Chris Firestone, professor and chair of the philosophy department at Trinity College. Uh, I served as the regular, I have been serving as a regular moderator of these debates for the last 13 years. The Trinity Debates, for those of you who don't know, began out of the philosophy department in, in sponsorship with the honors program at Trinity College. Early on, these debates featured distinguished Christian philosophers such as Paul Moser, Keith Yandel, Cliff Williams, and Harold Netland, disputing topics ranging from substance dualism to religious pluralism. The debates have since migrated over to the uh, Henry Center and in recent years, we've hosted debates between distinguished Christian theologians and thinkers such as Wayne Grudem, L. Moeller, Bruce Ware, Jim Wallace, etc., covering, covering topics ranging from the nature of the Trinity and the relationship between the gospel and social justice. As you can see, the Henry Center has done a wonderful job both here tonight and through the years uh, with these debates. With this debate in particular, I want to thank uh, Jeffrey Fulkerson and Tom McCall for your behind-the-scenes work in getting us this far, and the rest of the Henry Center and IT staff for filling in the gaps and pushing us to the finish line. I also want to thank uh, Ted's New Testament Assistant Professor Joshua Jipp for stirring the pot of, on the Henry Center blog site for the last week or two. Uh, and graduate student and vice president of the TED's student body, Alex, uh, Alex Pierce, for stirring my mind on this topic. I can't deny that uh, a few of my introductory comments are probably shamelessly uh, borrowed from those sources. Uh, tonight's debate centers uh, on the gospel, not necessarily in its core propositional content, but rather in the way it is applied to God's people. To my knowledge, neither participant will dispute the fact that Jesus is the second person of the Godhead, that Jesus was uniquely begotten of the Father, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Nor will they dispute that on the third day he ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God the Father, and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Where they disagree rather starkly, however, is over how they understand the claims of the Apostle Paul in his epistles, particularly the letter to the Romans, about how salvation by way of the gospel unfolds in the life of the believer. Dr. Douglas Moo defends a classic Lutheran position that understands justification as the initiation into salvation in a moment of regenerative belief in Jesus. We are justified before God through faith in Jesus, according to his finished work on the cross. At conversion, when one believes in the gospel, one is justly acquitted by God. Sanctification happens as a real entailment of justification. God sees us as righteous 
the moment we believe in Jesus and we work out our salvation having already been made alive in Christ. This is what is meant by the word forensic or forensic justification or what we're gonna call classic Lutheran position. In the economy of salvation, justification comes after the conviction of sin and at the moment of belief, where we turn to God but are not yet transformed into Christ's likeness. God declares us innocent because of Jesus' substitutionary atonement. Sanctification and glorification follow in the ongoing life, eventual death, and final resurrection of the believer. Dr. Douglas Campbell is among a growing number of scholars challenging this forensic understanding of justification. Rather than being merely a momentary matter focused on human salvation and its relationship to divine satisfaction, Campbell's approach suggests that Pauline justification is essentially about the entire life of the Christian, wherein we are progressively liberated from sin and death through the working out of our faith in this world based on our union with Christ. This happens primarily, though not exclusively, in reconciled relationships with others and is capped off in the final judgment wherein justification is effected for all time in the sanctified and glorified life of the believer. Only then and there are we finally and completely reconciled with God. Dr. Campbell understands the common dimensions of salvation, namely justification, sanctification, and glorification to be blended in the life of the believer. Believers are progressively released from the bondage of sin and death in union with Christ and via the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm sure they're gonna have a lot more to say about this than me, but I'm just trying to give you what I take to be a layman or a philosopher's account of where they stand. Um, let me go ahead and introduce them now to you. Dr. Douglas Moo has taught for 38 years at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and Wheaton College, where he currently holds the Kenneth T. Westner Chair in Biblical Studies. He has written numerous commentaries covering Paul's letter to the Romans, Galatians, Colossians, and Philemon, as well as commentaries on James and 2 Peter. He has also co-authored with D.A. Carson an introduction to the New Testament. He is currently working on a book on creation care with his son Jonathan and on Pauline theology. Additionally, he serves as chair of the Committee on Bible Translation the group of scholars charged with overseeing the new international version of the Bible. He and his wife, Jenny, enjoy nature photography and spending time with their five married children and 10 grandchildren. Please join me in giving a warm Trinity welcome to Dr. Douglas Moo. Although born in London, Dr. Douglas Campbell was raised in New Zealand from the age of four and self-identifies as a Kiwi. He attended the University of Toronto, receiving an MA and a PhD in religious studies. He has taught at the University of Otago, King's College London, and for the past 12 years at Duke University. Since taking the position at Duke, he has written the quest for Paul's gospel, which he calls the appetizer, a mere 304 pages, before the 1300 page main course, The Deliverance of God, in 2009 with Erdman's. This past year he wrote Framing Paul, an epistolary biography, I don't know if that, 448 page dessert perhaps, uh, okay. <laughs> Since moving to the U.S., he and his wife have uh, also become deeply involved in prison uh, ministry and, uh, and justice work. He now directs the program in prison studies at Duke Divinity School. His son is getting married in April, and his daughter has just moved to D.C. to take up her first post-college job. <laughs> Only for those days, okay. <laughs> Being an empty nester, 
He now enjoys spending quality time with his wife, Rachel, and his dog and his cat, whose uh, names I've not yet been able to ascertain. Um, please join me in giving a warm Trinity welcome to Dr. Douglas Campbell. Okay, now for the format and rules for this evening. This Trinity debate will run according to the following format. The participants will each have 20 minutes for their respective opening statements. This will be followed by a 10 minute formal response from each participant. We will then have a five minute informal response. Uh, and then uh, finally, a two minute response to the response as we tail off into the Q&A. After those back and forth, uh, four back and forth movements, we will open, the bait, uh, open this to dis, uh, questions from the audience and people online. I, I will do my best to include everyone in the Q&A, as many people as possible. As you can see, we have uh, standard microphones here. They'll be set up so that you guys can ask questions on the, in, in the side aisles. Um, our team will also be monitoring Twitter. For those of you who are watching this live and streaming online, I understand there's an even larger crowd online around the world getting uh, tweets from Australia and other places, perhaps even New Zealand. Uh, please uh, keep your questions concise and on topic. Limit yourself to two or three sentences only. I would ask that about three people at a time line up. Let's not, uh, you know, uh, rush the microphones if we can. And I'll apologize in advance for anyone who doesn't get the opportunity to ask a question. The whole event will conclude no later than 9 p.m. Each participant and member of the audience will be notified by me if they're transcending time limitations according to the rules I've just outlined. So without further ado, I would like to invite forward the person who's going to answer yes to our question, Dr. Douglas Moo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Firestone, and for the Henry Center to uh, invite me here for this time of reflection on the important matter of Pauline justification. In 1517, uh, Martin Luther posted 95 theses on the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg. In faint imitation of this precedent, I offer 14 theses on Pauline justification. My theses fall 81 short of Luther's, nor do I expect anyone to post them on the doors of the ATO chapel. <laughs> Indeed, as a New Testament exegete and non-Lutheran, I suspect that this attempt to summarize the Lutheran view on Pauline justification is uh, quite far above my pay grade. Qualifying the Pauline teaching I am summarizing with Lutheran makes sense in light of the doctrine's origins and importance in the Lutheran theological tradition. But what I will outline is a broadly Reformation teaching that has been adopted in many Protestant traditions. Indeed, if this doctrine has breadth, it also has depth. Many elements in the core uh, doctrine of justification have a long history uh, in the early church. Thesis one, the doctrine of justification is defined primarily by the New Testament and especially Pauline use of the verb justify, dikaiao, and related occurrences of the adjective just, dikaios, and the noun righteousness, dikaiosune. Certain Protestant traditions have expanded justification to include virtually the whole of soteriology. Such a move robs the doctrine of its special function within the larger soteriological spectrum. On the other hand, some scholars narrow the doctrine almost to the vanishing point. I underline the word related in my statement of this thesis. The doctrine or concept of justification is not coextensive with the range of the Dick word group. Not all occurrences of these words should count in constructing the doctrine, nor is the concept justification confined 
to this word group. This word concept interface creates a significant methodological challenge in constructing the doctrine on the basis of scripture. One must, in my view, proceed by identifying a core set of texts to define the doctrine. Thesis two, New Testament language describing justification is drawn from the OT, where key occurrences of the relevant vocabulary have a forensic denotation. The widespread and theologically significant use of the terminology in the LXX, along with Paul's frequent appeal to the OT in discussing the words, shows that the Old Testament slash Jewish background is decisive. Words from the Greek dick root occasionally, though not universally, I'm sorry, consistently, though not universally, translate words from the Sedek Hebrew root. The hyphial form of the verb from this root is especially relevant. It means to declare righteous in the context of a court of law. Much more common in the OT are the noun righteousness and the adjective righteous. The noun is used in a a wide variety of of ways, a spectrum of usage that has spawned a long scholarly debate about a possible core idea for the terminology. I think the idea of right order or rightness, stemming from the way that God has created the world we live in, gets to the heart of righteousness language. Thus to cite a spectrum of Old Testament texts, A weight is right when it conforms to agreed upon standards of measurement, Leviticus 19.36. A person, whether in covenant relationship or not, is right when he or she conforms to the standards built into this world by God, as dikaios very often is used in Proverbs. An Israelite is right when he or she conforms to the expectations of the covenant relationship, as in, for instance, Ezekiel 18.9. God's decrees are right when and because they conform to his own person and will, as in, for instance, Deuteronomy 4.8. God is right, furthermore, when he punishes his people, Nehemiah 9.33, and at the same time, right when he vindicates his people, as in, for instance, Isaiah 51.4-8. Because both punishment and vindication are rooted in God's warnings and promises. Old Testament righteousness, then, is no arbitrary matter. It is rooted in a world with certain inalienable rights and wrongs that reflect, in turn, God himself. By very definition, God is bound to these standards, imposed, of course, not from without, but from his own unchangeable nature. Thus, as Exodus 23, 7 makes clear, God, quote, will not acquit the guilty, close quote. Old Testament justification thus takes the form of a legal recognition of an already existing righteousness. Thesis three. In justification, God declares that a sinner is right before him a purely forensic declaration that is to be distinguished from transformation or sanctification. The forensic only view of justification is the cutting edge of the Reformation doctrine. In contrast to a broader view of justification rooted in Augustine with its tendency to fold sanctification into justification, the reformers insisted that the sinner's legal standing given in justification, both precedes and grounds the sinner's moral transformation. This forensic only view of justification is tied to particular perspectives on several other theological issues, especially sin, grace, and the sacraments. But it is also rooted in the New Testament vocabulary of justification. In Romans, Paul presents God's justifying work as the gracious response to the human predicament, which he describes in terms of wrath and the revelation of God's righteous judgment, when he repays each person according to what they have done, 
Romans 2, 6. And judges people's secrets, Romans 2, 16. Justification is the opposite of condemnation, as in Romans 8, 33. The purely forensic nature of justification is classically expressed in Paul's claim that God is one who, quote, justifies the ungodly, Romans 4, 5. And in a more indirect way, Paul reveals his forensic only view of justification in his recognition that people might misconstrue his teaching as an excuse for continuing in sin, Romans 6, 1 and following, as well as Galatians 2.17. Thesis four, justification is before God, meeting the fundamental need for sinners to be accepted before a holy God. As a judicial metaphor, justification refers to a declaration of right standing before the cosmic judge. Of course, the sinner who is justified before God is immediately and inevitably introduced into the people of God with all the privileges and responsibilities arising from membership in this new spiritual family. But justified does not in itself mean, as N.T. Wright has argued, be recognized as a member of the people of God. Wright is correct to claim that the presenting problem in a book like Galatians is indeed a people problem. On what terms should Gentiles be recognized as the seed of Abraham? But Paul responds to this issue by appealing to the more fundamental human issue. How can anyone, Jew or Gentile, be brought into right relationship with God? Galatians 2, 15 to 17. The point of emphasis is similar in Romans, where salvation for Jew and Gentile alike is rooted in the prior claim that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. The inclusion of Gentiles in the people of God rests on the prior and more fundamental matter of the gospel offer of justification to all who believe. Thesis 5. Justification does not include internal transformation or the creation of moral righteousness within the justified sinner. This thesis states negatively what we have said already in thesis three, but its importance for the Reformation teaching and the intensity of current debate demand further discussion. A number of recent interpreters echoing a minor strand in the Reformation theological heritage, want to expand the scope of justification to include a transformative element. They often appeal to certain occurrences of righteousness, which seem to have a distinctly moral focus. To be sure, with other New Testament authors, Paul sometimes uses righteousness with a moral sense. But these occurrences should not be incorporated into the concept of Pauline justification. We return here to the methodological challenge of distinguishing word and concept. Paul operates with two semantic categories of righteousness language, and they can be distinguished on the basis of sound syntagmatic considerations. It is a mistake to merge these categories. Another approach is to argue that God's justifying word, since it by nature affects what it says, must truly create righteousness for a person. True. But it would be a fundamental confusion of categories to move from the forensic meaning of this word to broader ethical connotations. God's word of justification does indeed accomplish what it intends putting the sinner in right relationship with him. Far from being a legal fiction, God's justifying act creates a reality of the most basic significance. The condemned sinner is released from sentence of death. Thesis six. Although justification being a forensic verdict does not include moral transformation, Justification is inseparably joined to sanctification, for both are given to believers in their union with Christ. 
Many of, the, uh, many of the scholars who expand justification to include transformation are motivated by a long-standing concern with the standard Reformation emphasis on justification by faith alone. An objection that, that sees the doctrine as creating a theological basis for ethical unconcern. However, the, re the response to this legitimate concern is not to expand justification to include moral transformation, a move that I think is both semantically unjustified and theologically problematic. Following the lead of Calvin and many others in the Reformed tradition, it does much better justice to Paul if we connect forensic justification and transformation by viewing both as inevitable and necessary products of our being in Christ. Thesis seven. Justification is a concept rooted in the Old Testament prediction that God would vindicate his faithful people, Israel. In several important Old Testament passages, God's righteousness refers to his activity in establishing right. God says in Isaiah 46, 13, I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away and my salvation will not be delayed. God's righteousness in such text denotes his putting his people in the right, not in a moral sense, but as an act of justice or vindication. This language is especially prominent in Isaiah 46 to 55, a passage that exerted considerable influence on Paul. This then seems to be one of the wells from which Paul draws his distinctive concept of God's righteousness, as well as the closely related language of justification. Thesis eight, God justifies not national Israel, but spiritual Israel, composed of all who belong to Christ, himself the embodiment of Israel. A distinctive focus of New Testament justification is therefore its availability to every person, whether Gentile or Jew. New perspective interpreters are quite right to draw attention to the importance of Gentile inclusion in Paul's teaching. The debate, however, hinges on the relative importance and means of integrating this people concern with what I deem to be the more fundamental anthropological issue. Thesis nine. Justification is actualized only by faith in Christ in contrast to any doing on the part of the human being. Sola fide is central to Reformation soteriology. An important exegetical basis for this claim is Paul's idea that justification or related concepts come not through works of the law, but through faith or Christ faith. The reformers understood this contrast to express a fundamental distinction between human believing on the one hand and human working or doing on the other. This polarity is widely questioned today with scholars proposing significant revisions to both ends of the spectrum. On the one end, works of the law are confined to Torah works or Torah adherence. And on the other, faith is interpreted, at least in many of its occurrences, to refer to Christ's own faith or faithfulness. Everyone now agrees that the phrase works of the law refers to Torah obedience. The question is whether the phrase connotes possession of Torah or performance of the Torah. That is, as Paul referring simply to status within the covenant marked out by Torah obedience, or is he referring to the actual doing of the law that was viewed as necessary to confirm covenant status? Paul is deeply concerned about the inclusion of Gentiles within the people of God and often uses works of the law in this context. But the phrase is elaborated by Paul himself as for instance in Romans four in terms of works in general. Paul explains the failure of works of the law to justify in terms of human sinfulness and not just covenant obsolescence. The reformers then were justified in viewing the phrase works of the law as a critical subset of the broader anthropological works. A concern by the way, that they shared with a series of important theologians preceding them. 
Revisionist interpreters dilute the Reformation faith versus works contrast on the other side by expanding faith to include some element of obedience and or by attributing faith to Christ rather than to humans. In response to the former, I appeal again to the fundamental and repeated contrasts Paul and New Testament authors make between faith and works. Even the much quoted phrase, obedience of faith, cited in favor of an expansive meaning of faith, proves just the opposite. For Paul, obedience and faith, while related, are two different things. My response to the latter approach can bypass the specific issue of the faith of Christ debate. It makes little ultimate theological difference if the phrase in its eight occurrences refers to human believing in Christ or Christ's own faith and faithfulness. A robust role for human faith and justification need not detract from God's initiative nor from Christ's centrality. With varying degrees of emphasis, the Reformation tradition stresses that faith itself is a product of divine intervention and enablement. Thesis 10, justification takes place in Christ, whose death atoned for our sins and whose resurrection secures our vindication. In contrast to some caricatures of the tradition, the Reformation teaching has always put Christ at the center of God's justifying act. Within the tradition, however, there has been considerable debate about the mechanism by which his work brings our justification. The Reformed wing of the Reformation has traditionally claimed that we are justified on the basis of the imputation of Christ's active and passive righteousness to us. Other Reformation traditions have not insisted on this point. Thesis 11. We are justified by grace alone. We cannot contribute anything to our justification. It is entirely from beginning to end a gift from God. Thesis 12. God remains righteous even while he justifies people who are in themselves ungodly because he views them in their union with Christ. As Paul puts it at the end of the important paragraph, Romans 3, 21 to 26, God both justifies sinners who believe in Christ and is just in doing so. Thesis 13, justification is part of the New Testament already not yet eschatological tension. We are definitively justified at conversion, but this decision must be confirmed at the judgment at which time our works are taken into account. Thesis 14, Justification is a critical element of New Testament soteriology. In my view, justification should not be made the center of New Testament theology or of Pauline theology, but it remains a critical doctrine that Paul uses in explicating the gospel, especially in guarding it against any idea of human merit as the basis for our ultimate standing with God. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm looking forward to having a a good discussion about this. Uh, In order to understand why I must say no tonight to the doctrine of justification, it's going to be necessary for me to outline quickly what I take to be Paul's genuine gospel. Is that all right? Am I echoing a bit? Good? Okay. Fortunately, this gospel will be quite familiar to most of you already as sanctification. Now, like a good Methodist, I emphasize this rather strongly. And when it is prefaced with the appropriate doctrine of election, as it is in Ephesians, I would suggest that sanctification basically is Paul's gospel. That is, his account of how we all get saved in the senses of being healed from sin and ultimately delivered from death. Now, Paul lays this gospel out most clearly in Romans 5 through 8. In those chapters, we learn that we're saved as the Holy Spirit grafts us onto the journey of Christ, so that in a very real, concrete sense, we participate in Him. However, this journey has two rather different stages. We participate first 
in Christ's obedient journey downward into death, where we enter into the extinction of our current sinful condition. Because Christ assumed our corrupt fleshly existence in the incarnation and then went on to terminate it in his execution, we too participate in this termination. And the power of sin has thereby been broken. Hallelujah. However, Christ was, of course, raised from the dead and enthroned on high where he is acclaimed as Lord. And so we too, in him, are resurrected and enthroned on high, the second stage in our shared journey. And this resurrected ground is the uh, location, is the ground of our current Christian behavior. We enter here into a new situation, free from evil powers like sin and death, and are able to respond to God with a full and joyful obedience, which is good news. Indeed, this is the good news. Now, it's no coincidence that baptism figures quite prominently in this discussion. Baptism narrates this journey first downward under the water and hence into Christ's death and then upward out of the water into a new and resurrected life. For Paul then, salvation is shaped baptismally. Moreover, it is clear by now that it is also affected, we might say, trinitarianly. This baptismal account of salvation presupposes the complete involvement of the Father who sends his only beloved Son to save a lost cosmos. The Son who was sent and obediently journeys into the human condition, ultimately dying there. And the Spirit who resurrects the Son and then Christians within him, breathing life upon them. So this is all gratifyingly orthodox and ecumenical, not to mention creedal. That is to say, the entire church sat, signed off on this account of God and its implicit account of the atonement some time ago in the Nicene Chalcedonian Confessions. So I summarize this approach to Paul's gospel for my students at Duke in terms of Trinitarian participation. This is not, of course, Paul's own summary, since he predated the church's long definition of these critical matters. Paul himself speaks simply of being in Christ, or some close equivalent. This phrase is spread through all his letters with over 160 occurrences, and furthermore, it does some heavy lifting. It summarizes every key argument in Romans 5 to 8. The stretch of text that I have just suggested contains the fullest account of this Trinitarian and participatory gospel. So to be in Christ is to be participating in Christ and hence sanctified and delivered by the triune God whom we worship, confess, and serve. With this briefest of soteriological summaries in place, let me now emphasize an important implication for our present topic. It's retrospective operation in relation to the perception of sin. We now think backwards about our sinful past. It is directly implicit in this gospel that Christians only know that they're being transformed in Christ through the Spirit as the transforming Trinitarian God reveals this to them. So Paul's life was changed by an apocalypse, a revelation of Jesus Christ. But in the light of this event, some remarkable clarifications tend to occur. In particular, it becomes especially apparent from this moment onward that we are deeply in the grip of sin, a phenomenon later appropriately captured by Calvin with his emphasis on total depravity. In this, Calvin is articulating the extent to which our human thinking outside of the work of Christ has been captured and distorted by sin, so that even our thinking about sin has been corrupted. Slightly dismal tale at this point, isn't it? Yeah. Hence, without the clarification provided by Christ, we tend to get things badly wrong. We call things that are perhaps not that sinful enormously sinful. And rather more importantly, we tend to overlook things that God is deeply concerned about. Consequently, as Augustine grasped with great clarity, somewhat earlier than Calvin, our confession which is to say, our understanding of sin and our attempted journey out of it in Christ, our repentance is fundamentally informed by Christ, while a deep consciousness of sin, 
including its increasingly accurate definition, is a sign of discipleship. Christ defines what sin is, and only in the light of Christ can we see sin clearly. Now, I tend to think about this process of retrospective clarification in terms of a drug addict who's been working his way through the 12-step program of AA, thereby breaking free from addiction and reaching real clarity at the same time about its seriousness. His retrospective account of his life, in which he looks back on his past difficulties, is the correct one. Now, with a mind clarified by the 12 steps, a mind also free from regular substance abuse, he narrates his former slavery to drugs and its destructive consequences for his life and his family. But he didn't speak like that before he came to AA and began to cooperate with help. Then, in the midst of his addiction, he almost certainly said, hey, I'm not an addict. I could give up my drug taking any time I want to. My occasional use of drugs is purely recreational. It's just harmless fun. Of course, these claims about the problem made prior to his recovery were utterly deluded. This addict's thought processes were twisted at this time by drugs and addiction into a deceptive narrative. And you can see that now from the vantage point of recovery. But we are all in the same situation as the addict when it comes to sin. Only in the light of Christ and under pressure from the Holy Spirit do our distorted minds begin to appreciate what sin really is as we struggle free from its addictions. Both Augustine and Calvin were quite right about this. And as Paul himself once put it, the mind of the sinful person is hostile to God. But if this is the case, then it is deeply problematic to make an accurate understanding of sin a precondition for conversion, as the doctrine of justification does, with its claim that the proclamation of the law must precede the proclamation of the gospel and its solution. You have to know that you will burn before you will decide to turn, right? A lot of us used to preach this way, but this order creates a problem and ultimately creates two. First, as we've just seen, totally depraved people will struggle to achieve any accuracy in their understanding of sin before they convert. They're in the full throes of addiction to sin. Their minds are twisted. They simply can't think straight about anything. So Paul himself, before his direct encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, was hunting down Christians because he thought that this was what God wanted him to do. At this moment in his life, this learned biblical scholar was getting the will of God absolutely and completely wrong, which does worry me, actually. All right. <laughs> Yet, this is what the doctrine of justification prescribes non-Christians must do before they can be saved. So this just doesn't seem realistic, and it certainly isn't how Paul got saved himself. Now, in the doctrine's defense, you might immediately say to me, well, how do people get saved? if they don't know they have a problem. But this objection presupposes a rationalistic account of conversion in which people think their way through to salvation. And as my revered colleague in church history, Grant Wacker, put it to me once, the only thing that unites the various sociologists of conversion is their universal agreement that conversion does not happen this way. People don't convert in rational progressions. They convert over time through friendships, something Paul was a master at, incidentally. And within these friendships, they convert for all sorts of reasons, meaning, worship, fellowship, even for food. Now, God can draw people in many, many different ways. People can still think about things on their way to conversion. I know I did. But after conversion, we must still bring every thought captive to Christ, including our definitions of sin, so that they can be clarified by the one who is the truth, as well as the way and the life, at which point it is becoming clear I am not just talking about sin. Any account of sin, of the bad, presupposes an account of the good, and hence an account of God. It is only in the light of the character and commands of God that we learn about what is good, and so learn to detect and repudiate what is bad. 
So if we commit strongly <clears throat> to accurate and enduring judgments about sin in the pre-Christian situation, then we are, second, really committing to accurate and enduring judgments about God in that situation at well, as well. At which point we are committing to accurate and enduring judgments about God apart from Christ. Moreover, we are necessarily involved with this. If we build our whole account of salvation on our account of a problem, as the doctrine of justification suggests, then we cannot abandon that account after we've been saved or our entire house will fall down. So the doctrine of justification asks us to resist redefining our understanding of God in the light of Christ. And I worry that this is basically Marcionite. Ooh. Our knowledge of God the Creator has now been separated from our knowledge of God the Redeemer, thereby denying Christ's role in creation and the intrinsic connections between creation, the covenant, and redemption. This is how the church loses its way culturally. I could talk about that for some time, but I don't have time. Now, we didn't mean to do this, of course, but this is where we end up. If we endorse this doctrine, at which moment we must reflect quickly in what the heart of the Reformation really was. Was it the promulgation of a doctrine <clears throat> excuse me, that asks us to make all the key judgments about God, the good, and human sin in advance of the arrival of the gospel in the figure of Christ, thereby ultimately undermining the importance of that arrival and that figure? I don't think so. Or was it the recovery of the truth that Jesus Christ must be at the beginning, the center, and the end of all true Christian thinking about both God and sin. An emphasis on the centrality and sovereignty of Christ is surely the enduring contribution of the Reformation more broadly and of Luther more narrowly. Let Christ be exalted in all things. Let the crucified Christ be exalted in all other thinking, recognized for what it is, a vain theology of glory. Now, Luther, of course, knew this well, as did Paul, at which moment I must very quickly gesture towards some exegetical matters. Is Paul, nevertheless, simply committed to a doctrine of justification at times? Does he occasionally abandon his usual dependence on Trinitarian participation and deploy, however inconsistently, a prospective model of salvation that does indeed ask converts to think on their sin and reach accurate judgments about it, and hence also about the good and about God, prior to deciding that they will accept Christ and thereby capturing and subordinating Christ within that web of prior commitments. I don't think so. I don't think that Paul ever actually set out a doctrine of justification, meaning by this a fully articulated model of salvation in terms of justification terms alone that stands over against other models that begin with revelation and articulate sin retrospectively and baptismally. Justification motifs that nuance aspects of his gospel of Trinitarian participation. Yeah, sure, no problem with that. But an independent doctrine standing by itself, I'm not so sure about that. You see, the key motifs in this doctrine, works of law, justification, righteousness, faith, are only combined in a systematic way by one text. Romans 1 to 3. So everything rests on how we read Romans 1 to 3. And here the justification for justification is surprisingly thin. If we expect Paul to be setting out his theology in these chapters and expect further that that theology will be justification, then we will find justification in this stretch of text. But Paul never tells us that it is, this is what he's going to do. So there's no explicit warrant from the scriptures themselves for reading this passage in this fashion. Hence, perhaps as good Protestants, we should step back from our church tradition just for a moment and consider whether the scriptures are telling us something different. And what I discovered when I tried to do this is that there is 
a perfectly good way of reading this text that avoids the nasty problems we just identified, a Socratic reading. Socratic arguments, which were a staple in the ancient world, don't begin with their own positions. They begin with their opponents' positions and go on to expose problems within those, largely through internal contradiction, ultimately ending up embarrassing and silencing their adversaries. And you know, Romans 1 to 3 reads very nicely as a Socratic argument. I won't bore you with all the details here, which I have laid out elsewhere with a great deal of enthusiasm. Suffice it to say that given this reading of Romans 1 to 3, Paul would no longer expect depraved sinners to understand their own sin accurately before they come to Christ. Indeed, he would be arguing almost the opposite. Missionaries who do have these expectations foolishly fail to understand their own depravity. He would be arguing cleverly. They would be theologians of glory, while he is, of course, a theologian of the cross who exposes the contradictions present within their learned pretensions. So a great virtue of this alternative reading is that it would avoid the vexed problem we, uh, we identified earlier on generated by justification, that sinners should understand their own sin accurately before they convert. We also avoid the even worse problem that sinners should understand God accurately before they know Christ. Any need for such definitive revelations in the pre-Christian state could now be avoided since they really depend on just this one text, which has now been reoriented. Well, the foregoing is, of course, nothing more than an exegetical gesture. But what I have said, nevertheless, hopefully suffices to show that it is possible to construe Paul consistently in terms of a gracious gospel of Trinitarian participation. It is because of this unconditional yes to us in Jesus Christ and the need for Paul to say this yes consistently and clearly that I must regretfully say no to a doctrine of justification as to any doctrine that threatens to obscure or to occlude his centrality and his importance. Thank you. Okay, we're going to be moving on to the 10-minute res formal responses. Both participants had these papers in their possession about a week ago, and so they've prepared 10-minute responses. Then we'll go to the five-minute informal responses after that. Dr. Moon. Sadly, the tyranny of time has prevented Dr. Campbell from presenting his full thesis on Pauline justification. And for the same reason, I am unable adequately to interact with that proposal. I would certainly, however, refer you to his book, The Deliverance of God, and my response to that book in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society, volume 53. My concern now is more narrowly to respond to Dr. Campbell's reasons for saying no to the Lutheran view of Pauline justification. Uh, I want to make four points. First, the relative importance of the parts of Romans. Dr. Campbell's claim that chapters five through, art, five through eight are the heart of the letter taps into a significant trajectory of scholars going back at least as far as Schweitzer and Vreda, and given renewed expression recently in several important studies. According to this trajectory, the heart of Paul's soteriology lies in the participationist categories of Romans 5 through 8, rather than in the forensic framework of chapters 1 to 4. The relationship between these two ways of picturing the work of Christ and Paul, between we might say Christ for us and we died with Christ, is complicated. But we can say, at the least, that both are important in the argument of Romans and in Paul's theology generally. Playing one off against the other illegitimately reduces the richness of Paul's soteriology. I am tempted to think that Paul's participation language indeed is a product of his larger representative category. That on the one hand, we sin and die in Adam because he represents us, and that on the other, we belong to Christ because he represents all who belong to him. 
I can therefore hardly endorse the importance of Romans 5 through 8 for Paul's soteriology without, however, diminishing the importance of Romans 1 to 4. I would add that the strong and legitimate concern to root our standing with God in an alien righteousness can and has led some advocates of the view I represent to underemphasize the believer's transformation and sanctification. Indeed, the turn of the argument at Romans 6 is perhaps the earliest example of an attempt to head off just this problem. Second, gospel. Dr. Cobb, Dr. Campbell claims that Paul sets forth most clearly his gospel focused on sanctification in Romans 5 through 8. Many recent interpreters have stressed the broad scope of the good news in Paul, an emphasis that I am generally happy to endorse. The good news is more than message about how individuals can be converted or saved. It embraces the entirety of God's unfolding program to extend his sovereign role into every sphere of the cosmos. Yet a quick glance at Paul's actual use of gospel language reveals that he most often applies it to that part of God's cosmic plan that offers sinners rescue from condemnation. While recognizing the danger of confusing word with Concept, I would note that Paul does not, in fact, use the language of gospel in Romans 5 through 8. He does, however, use it in Romans 1.16 to refer to the salvation available in Christ to all who believe, a salvation made possible by the revelation of God's righteousness. Third, the perspective problem. Dr. Campbell justifies his no to the justification doctrine I have outlined, mainly on the claim that the theory, and I quote, presupposes a rationalistic account of conversion in which people think their way through to salvation, close quote. This justification doctrine then is an inadequate account of Paul's soteriology because its logic requires that human beings must first recognize their own sinfulness before a righteous God before they can embrace the good news offered in Christ. To use the categories often employed in discussion of this issue, justification theory is built inescapably on the sequence of plight and then solution. I find this objection unwarranted. Why? Because the Reformation teaching about justification does not in fact require this mode of argument for its validity. The confusion here, it seems to me, is between two different levels of discourse. On the one level, we have the experience of humans who convert to Christ. I agree with Dr. Campbell that our experience often takes the form of solution first and then plight. As he suggests, this was the experience of the Apostle Paul. I see no good evidence that Paul was plagued by a sense of sin and guilt before his Damascus Road experience. The revelation of Christ came to him out of the blue. And I think a lot of Paul's own theology, including his understanding of the human plight, came as a result of reflection on that transformative experience. I would, however, want to add that this by no means is the only pattern of conversion. As a good Methodist, Dr. Campbell will know that John Wesley himself experienced a sense of alienation from God until his heart was strangely warm. Many others have come to Christ out of a sense of unworthiness or frustration with their inability to please God. I think doctors, uh, Dr. Campbell's tendency to deny this reality is perhaps the result of drinking too long and deeply from a Bartian well. Therefore, while I agree with Dr. Campbell about the noetic effects of sin, I would allow more scope for natural revelation and common grace than he does. In general, however, I am happy to endorse Dr. Campbell's insistence that most converts to Christianity only recognize the depths of their plight in light of the solution that they find and experience in Christ. Nevertheless, my basic point here is that the sequence events in our experience of conversion has nothing to do with the integrity or truth of justification. 
Paul does not argue in Romans 1 to 3 that justification is the answer to human perception of their own sinfulness. Rather, he argues that justification is the answer to the reality of sinfulness. He argues not at the level of human experience, but at the level of divine reality. And it is this level of discourse that justifies Paul's teaching on justification. Paul presents the good news of God's justifying work in Christ as the answer to universal human sinfulness and, and, and consequent human ability to please God. All humans, Gentile and Jew alike, are under sin, Romans 3.9, and can therefore never by their own efforts find favor with God. This is true whether humans realize it or not. But experience of sinfulness is not the same thing as the reality of sinfulness. Some, current, some converts may see justification as the joyful answer to their long struggle with sin. Others may come to realize their sinfulness and the gracious divine response of justification only after coming to know Christ as their Lord. Both, whatever their own pre-Christian thinking may have been, are sinners who have offended a just and holy God and need to be justified in order to stand in God's presence. Four, Romans one to three. Although this methodological point is not spelled out in detail in Dr. Campbell's paper, he does mention his Socratic reading of these chapters. By adopting such an approach, Dr. Campbell renovates texts in this part of Romans that would otherwise seem to support justification theory to a teacher with whom Paul disagrees. As is well known, Romans 1 to 3 appears to claim that God has revealed his justifying righteousness in response to the tragic reality of universal human sin. That sin must be judged by a righteous God who Paul claims will repay each person according to what they have done. Justification, in other words, is rooted in a certain conceptual framework that features a righteous God who inevitably and necessarily reacts to human sin and wrath. In this framework, justification is not a simple act of deliverance from the powers of sin and death. It is the explanation of how a holy, righteous God bring human sinners into his presence. The Lutheran view of justification assumes the reality of a God who acts equitably and justly, of a God who has sent his son to provide the full payment for what people have done, and who can be, therefore, the God who remains just while at the same time justifying sinful people. The removal, in other words, of the language of retribution would appear to be essential for Dr. Campbell's counterproposal about justification to stand. Attributing this language to a teacher is a nifty way of removing this language. But I find the evidence for such quotations from a rival teacher far from convincing, and few other interpreters in the long and varied history of Romans interpretation have detected any such quotations. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so because of the sequence of the papers, I'm actually rebutting the very first paper we heard tonight. So you have to kind of set the clock back, and then I think we'll pick this up in a few minutes, Doug. Um, okay, so put your minds back to 10 past seven. Uh, we need to appreciate that it's really thesis two that does all the heavy lifting for Doug. Everything in Doug's account of what we're calling tonight the doctrine of justification flows from the claims that he makes there. And if those claims are true, then everything follows pretty much as he says it does. <clears throat> so what are they? The concept of justification is judicial or forensic. Now Doug actually means by this a particular notion of the forensic and a particular account of justice. It is, as he just said, retributive. God will punish covenant unfaithfulness, not to mention presumably sin. So Doug is selecting here one definition of justice and the forensic from about 10 different accounts that are currently discussed by political philosophers and the like. Moreover, God has created the world we live in in this way because this reflects in turn God himself. Now these are big claims. Everything turns on them, which is to say, 
on whether they're true or not. But how does Doug know that they are true? Well, he might appeal to the Bible. Indeed, he does. But he has, of course, interpreted the Bible in the light of these prior assumptions. He privileges one word group and set of stories in the Old Testament over many, many others. He does not foreground keset or mercy, berit or covenant, fatherhood or love or faithfulness. And he's privileged one text in Paul as well, reading it in a certain way, Romans 2, Romans 1, Romans 2. So he didn't begin his account of Paul, he didn't begin it with 1 Corinthians 1 or Ephesians 1 or even with Romans 8 or 5, all of which might take us in a slightly different direction. So his underlying assumptions about the nature of God and about the world in terms of retributive justice are playing a very important role in all of this. They are driving his analysis and framing everything that follows. Now, please don't misunderstand me at this moment. I am quite happy for underlying assumptions about God to drive our analyses and frame all that follows. But they need to be the right assumptions, so we need to pause to ask just how he knows that what he's claiming here, at the very basis of our Christian faith, is actually true. And obviously, I'm going to make um, a suggested correction, having drunk deep from the Bartian waters. <laughs> <laughs> The only point at which God has ever intersected perfectly and fully with our created and fallen reality is Jesus Christ. Uh, there we see what God is really like, and only there. Only there is God actually fully present, in distinction but without the confusion or separation of the two natures involved. So this place, known ultimately only through the further work of God and the person of the Holy Spirit, but then attested by the scriptures, and certainly most enthusiastically by Paul, is where we must get all our basic assumptions about the nature of God and the world and justice from. Our basic assumptions about God must be controlled by how God has chosen to reveal himself to us, most fully in person in the incarnation of the Son. And what we learn there is, in fact, what we read in a passage like Romans 8, 29 to 31. I'll paraphrase it. The basic truth underlying all of creation is the Father's desire to create a fellowship of people to share eternity with him through his Son and their spirit. The heart of all reality is personal, and its inner, its inner rationale is relational and loving. The Father has loved the Son from before the foundation of the world, and God loves us, because God is love. That is why the Father sent his only Son to die for us, while we were still hostile sinners. God is committed to us permanently and irrevocably and completely. This love is so deep, we lack the capacity even to imagine it or to understand it, although we sense it's out working dimly as we see God at work in our own lives and the lives of those around us, gently healing and restoring and forgiving. It is this love that pulls a rebellious and broken cosmos back into fellowship, healing and restoring it. Now, the result of this realization is that at the heart of all our thinking about God, we must use analogies that are filial and familial, personal analogies, and the relationships between persons are to be characterized by unconditional love. This is the reality that lies at the center of the universe as revealed by Jesus Christ. And in the light of this truth, with our addicted and abused minds being clarified by grace, we can turn to see where we might mistakenly have constructed God in our own image. Now, the controlling analogies that Doug deployed from the outset of his analysis, I think, I'm being fair here, are legal and political. He assumes, at least in part, that God relates to humanity like a sovereign in terms of law, transgression, wrath, conditions, punishment. The deepest truth of the universe for him is therefore legal. And this means, among other things, I must ask, we must ask, does God really love us? If this is right, the basis of any relationship with God would be a legal contract. 
So even for Christians, this God has to be conditioned by a paid penalty into actually loving us. And we only access this affection if we fulfill certain conditions. If we fail to fulfill those conditions, we experience God as God really is, a legal sovereign who will punish and ultimately execute us. Does this God really love us? Now think about all this for a moment. I'm the father of two children, a son and a daughter. I love my kids dearly, despite what they say about me, and what, on occasion, they have done. At times, I have been deeply, deeply grieved by them. But they will never, ever not be my son and my daughter, and I will never, ever not be their father. Nothing they can do will ever change the fact that I am their father and they are my children. And this is what God is like. God is our father and Christ is our brother. We have been made part of a divine family and incomprehensible privilege and joy. Yet sadly, we have often folded the love of God inside the justice of God and have ended up misunderstanding both we need to fold the justice of God inside the love of God and end up grasping what God is really like in both of these respects. Now, don't forget, there is nothing more judgmental than a loving parent. Nowhere is accountability more strict and the quest for honesty more sustained. I should have added grandparent there, shouldn't I? Yes? Nowhere is accountability more strict and the quest for honesty more sustained than in a deeply loving and committed parent. Will there be wrath there? Oh, you betcha. <laughs> anger aplenty. But it is the right sort of anger. The anger grieved and affronted by the abuse of loving relationships. So it acts in the right sort of way to deal with that, restoratively. It is a loving anger that never lets go and never gives up on the object of its grief. So let me close here by just noting that I think Paul knew all this, and I think we misread him when we replace the categories of family and sonship at the basis of his thinking with legal analogies. Um, when Doug set up his account of justification in Thesis 2, you might not have noticed, but he never mentioned Jesus. Not once. We had to wait till Thesis 6 for Christ to arrive, by which point he was being fitted into an account of God that was already in place. So I suspect that his key assumptions were derived without reference uh, to Jesus' revelation of who God really is. And I think this is a mistake. I mean, I think it's a very well-intentioned and common mistake. I think it's understandable, but I do think it's a mistake. As Colossians 1, 15 to 20 states so clearly, Christ is at the center of redemption and creation. He is the one through whom all things were made and in whom all things will be consummated. And so as Ephesians also says, he is the one in relation to whom we must try to understand all things, allowing him to straighten out our distorted and bent thinking so that we grow up into him, learning thereby to resist sinful distractions and the buffeting winds of false teaching. May that be our reality, our hope, and our prayer. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the five-minute informal responses, and you can take on whatever comments you uh, like to handle there. Dr. Moo. I am now in the enviable spot of having to speak against Christ and love. So... <laughs> Let me do so with vigor. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm not terribly good at thinking on my feet, so I apologize if I'm really not going to meet some of the issues uh, that Douglas has raised. I'll use the first name as well. Uh, but uh, a few things uh, come to mind. Um, first, uh, the, and perhaps the most important issue here is where we are deriving our categories in which we can think about the matters before us tonight. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that, of course, our focus tonight has been on justification. 
I, I continue to think that that language, that concept, that metaphor does reside in a legal context. But it is, of course, not the only, nor maybe even the most important of the various sort of metaphorical worlds that Scripture uses to present God and his work in Christ to us. So I wouldn't want to be thought to enshrine a political or legal way of thinking as the fundamental way to think about uh, revelation and God and what it means for him to be uh, for us. Paul is free and the New Testament authors are free to use a lot of different conceptual worlds to try to get at uh, what God has done for us in Christ. Legal is one where I think justification does reside. Uh, I, I'm of course quite happy to acknowledge that in Christ, we indeed are given the fullest and clearest picture of God. But, but I would wanna qualify what, what Douglas has said in a couple of ways. First, it, it is not the only place we receive that. And it does seem to me we have a long Old Testament revelation that at least in salvation history and for the early Christians precedes Christ and provided many of the categories in which they necessarily must have thought about this man from Nazareth claiming to be the Messiah promised in the Old Testament scriptures. And I would just submit to you that the Old Testament structure is built around covenant and the law that is part of the covenant that the history of Israel is the history of a people who are asked by God to obey his law, who fail to do so, who are sent into exile, judged by God. And at that point, God in his infinite mercy promises grace beyond exile, that he will do a new work. But that new work is not a work that simply cancels or forgets or conveniently pushes aside the legal framework that God has established in the covenant with Israel. God's law can't just be uh, sort of swept under the carpet like we grandparents do with our grandchildren. Uh, uh, there, 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 there has to be an accounting. And I think that's where justification uh, has a significant place to, 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 to play. Um, yes, mercy, love, covenant, chesed, and so forth. Uh, all of these concepts are certainly uh, important, uh, but often in the Old Testament, they are put in the framework of God's rescue operation required by a previous fall into sin. In other words, uh, they, they are an attempt uh, on, on God's part to use these things to uh, provide a way for humanity to come back into relationship with God. So in that sense, they aren't fundamental uh, I, I think at the, at the end of the day, and this might be useful as we continue to think about our subject tonight, the key difference between us lies in this matter of a conception of God. Is, is God one who indeed is both loving Father and uh, righteous uh, sovereign who reacts to sin with wrath? Uh, I think so, and these rightly have to be combined I don't think that's necessarily folding love into justice or subordinating it to it. I think these are allowing both God's holiness, his necessary response of wrath against sin to stand alongside the reality of his grace and love at the same time without uh, trying to subordinate one to the other or to play these off against each other. Uh, it seems to me that ultimately, God's purpose is not simply to enter into fellowship with human beings. God's ultimate end is to glorify himself in and through, among other things, the creation of a people uh, in Christ uh, as he has graciously done. I felt like you were kind of agreeing with me there quite a lot, Doug. <laughs> hey, listen, I do not have a problem with wrath. Didn't you get that? Uh, I really don't. Um, but there are different sorts of wrath. Um, there's the wrath of a parent, and there's the wrath of an executioner. And these two types of wrath do very different things, very different things. And I think it's important as Christians to try and think as clearly as we can about them. Speaking of which, 
um, how do we read the Old Testament and God's purposes out of creation and use those categories as we're trying to speak about Paul and the gospel? I think we need to think patristically about this and grasp on to the motif they developed in the first two centuries, uh, which was that Christ is the mysterion. He's the divine secret that lay at the heart of all of creation and of Israel that is now revealed to the church and that provides the key to everything that goes on. And so the Old Testament needs to be appropriated with a Christological lens. And Paul's quite explicit about this, 2 Corinthians. You know, whatever, whatever promises God said in the past, they are yes, in Christ Jesus. Now I see clearly what's going on since before the foundation of the world. And before the foundation of the world, what we learn is that God has elected to be in fellowship with us, to be in a family, to love us, to be together. Um, and so the purposes of creating a people is positive. It's not negative. Uh, Christ is not sent to save us from plan A that's gone wrong. Christ has always been plan A. And he comes to pull plan A back on track. Okay? So whenever we interject another model or get it in between, the purposes of God and Christ revealed um, from the get-go, to be in relationship with us, we kind of mess things up. We turn God into a plan A, plan B God, uh, which I think, you know, is a bad idea. Uh, Jesus is never plan B. He's plan A. And I think that's a really, really strong, reformed, reformational, even Calvinist insight. I mean, Calvin really got this. I think he did some slightly weird stuff with it. But he got it, okay? <laughs> okay, he got it. We've got to think about God before the foundation of the world in Jesus Christ. Um, so let me, yeah, if that's clear, just very quickly, um, the nomos is not a law. Uh, the nomos in the Old Testament is Torah. The Torah is not a law. It doesn't function the way law functions in our society. It functions the way the Bible functions for you and I. It's a presentation in sacred texts of God's expectations and will for us that we are enjoined to learn from to teach one another, and to live our lives ethically in the light of. Uh, so it's not fundamentally a document that sets up a punitive situation or a conditional situation. It's an instructional and a pedagogical situation. And when Christ comes, he is the Torah. Once we've got the living voice of the living God speaking to us and to one another, we can't go back to written texts and make those superior to God himself. We have to read those texts and let God read those texts for us. This is extremely important. It's extremely important because if we resist the voice of the living God, what we risk doing is erecting our own wisdom and our own conceits on the basis of our own interpretive operations. And this is something that will get us into trouble. Okay? Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased. I think... Um, an awful lot of what you were saying, Doug, in your first paper, I found myself nodding in agreement. Um, in the rebuttal paper, I was going, well, you know, this is kind of cool, a lot of this stuff. In the rebuttal of the rebuttal, I actually thought that was great. I, I think we're not that far apart. But I've said this before, and I've been smacked down, so probably I should just sit down. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if we're not that far apart, I'm worried. Um. Uh, just, just a couple final remarks. I, I want to give you all time to engage in, in, in the discussion here. Um, yes, I certainly wouldn't want to suggest the plan A and plan B. Clearly, God's purpose uh, to send Christ as he did has been his plan from the beginning. Uh, I would just want to argue again that a central part of the unfolding of that plan is the revelation of the human sin problem in relationship to a righteous God. I still think that's part of the broad plan. Uh, Torah, yes, it clearly has a broader reference at times, and yet Torah still remains something that God expects his people to obey and something for, for, for which he punishes them when they do not. That, that, that moves to me in the category of law, not just in the category of instruction or teaching. Israel ends up in exile because of her failure to obey the law. Um, and thus God promises in his new act of grace that that law now will be written on the hearts of his people in the new covenant era.
So I agree entirely with the centrality of Christ, needing to read the Old Testament in light of Christ. Yes, uh, all of that uh, I, I agree with. I think it still comes down to the effect of that reading on our overall conception of the plan of salvation and the place of, ret of retributive justice uh, in that plan. Very quickly, very quickly. Um, what I'm not hearing you take on board, Doug, and this is important, is the fact that Jesus revealed sin. And this is why we have the Gospels. Uh, when Christ came, he really wanted to clarify a few things definitively. Matthew's Gospel, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wanted to say, amongst other things, I don't want you to read the Old Testament violently. Okay? Really, really important hermeneutical clarification there coming from the guy who wrote it. All right? We need to listen to that. Um, I really don't have a problem with sin being revealed, but I really want it to be a Christian journey. This has to be part of our discipleship. This has to be part of something that we deal with because God is helping us to deal with it. This is not something we can get under control before we come to Christ and get hooked up to Christ. This is not something we handle by ourselves. This is something we need God's help with. We're addicts, okay? Not rationalistic people that can hand, we're not little liberals running around before we come to Jesus, all right? Uh, second thing, justification, defined forensically. Yeah, mm, okay, what about Paul's usage of justification, the verb dikaio, Romans 6, 7, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it's in the context of baptism. That's why I talked about baptism. Baptism tells you something about dikaio, the way Paul wants to talk about it. Now, as you know, Paul spent a heck of a lot of time in jail, and what would happen is an official would say, okay, get rid of this guy. Let him go. We won't kill him today. Verdict. It's not about innocence. It's a verdict of liberation. And Paul is set free from the prison that he is in, the dank, dark cell, where possibly he's been writing letters. So it's got a liberational thrust where we get out of the jail of our imprisonment to the powers of darkness. That's justification, and that's what we need. That's the good news when we stand up and preach that to people around us. Yeah. <laughs> You're worried, right? Okay, it looks like we've got a good chance here for Q&A. I want to encourage our people, folks online, to uh, get those Twitter questions to us. Uh, but we're going to start with uh, questions. I've prepared questions from two TEDS professors. And I would invite them to come on forward. Uh, the first question, I think, will be for Dr. Mu from uh, New Testament Assistant Professor Joshua Jip. Dr. Mu, thanks for your clear presentation. Um, I'll keep this brief. I'm wondering what role Christ, particularly his resurrection, if any role, plays in justification. Um, I don't remember hearing much about that, but I'm thinking of certain texts like the end of Romans 4, Christ was raised for our justification. 1 Timothy 3.16, uh, he appeared in the flesh, was justified in the spirit. I mean, there, there, there's more of these, of course, but I'm wondering if there's a certain role Christ's resurrection has with respect to justification, and then how that relates to justification as something that's forensic. Thanks, yes. Um, uh, I think there's considerable thinking among a number of people going on these days about how the resurrection of Christ has that kind of soteriological value. In other words, that the resurrection of Christ is not simply an apologetic issue. He was raised so we know he truly was who he claimed to be, but that the resurrection itself actually affects something. Um, I did spend most of my time, yes, on the death of Christ because I think that's where Paul spends most of his time. If you just you know, count up the number of occurrences, it's pretty clear that it's the sacrificial death that is the heart of Paul's understanding of justification. Uh, it seems to me that resurrection, particularly if we understand 1 Timothy 3.16, to mean as the NIV translates, of course the NIV has it right, uh, was, vindicated, <laughs> was vindicated in or by the Spirit, so that the resurrection was a, a, a vindication, a, 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 a demonstration that Christ was indeed in the right so are being raised with Christ uh, and our ultimate resurrection at the time of judgment is uh, uh, the vindication in a kind of legal, broadly legal sense at least, 
of uh, the rightness of the believer who has trusted in Christ and does go free in the judgment because of that. I certainly have more thinking to do about that though. I apologize for a rather um, brief and somewhat inconsistent response, I suspect. Can I just jump in here? <laughs> this is what I was trying to say uh, just before. Um, the, the problem that Doug sets up between, for us as human beings is we have a problem with God because God has a problem with us. Because God is, so that's, kind of like, that's like the main problem. Now, I absolutely do not deny that God is really irritated with a lot of the things that we do. But I think that Paul's account of the gospel is actually targeting a very different principal problem. And the problem is death. It's corruption, finitude, and death. And what Paul is offering you is a gospel of life that sets you free now and takes you beyond the grave. And justification fits into that. Justification refers to the way Christ's resurrection is your resurrection, breaking in now but taking you on into a kingdom where you can live forever in perfection and fellowship. Uh, so this is a pretty big problem. We all face it. Um, I face it more and more <laughs> as I go on. I think about it more and more. Uh, but it really is a very powerful message. Um, if we can proclaim that loudly to the world around us, I really think we'll get a hearing. I really think it will... Sp the world around us spend, does nothing except try to pretend that it doesn't have an issue with death. I mean, it massages its body mercilessly to pretend that aging is not taking place. It doesn't talk about death. It, won't, it doesn't know what to do at a funeral. Um, whereas Christians know what to do. We're very, very different with the message of hope and life in those circumstances. I think there's a very powerful message if we can get hold of it. Yeah? Okay. Okay, I've got a question here from uh, Ted's professor, Constantine Campbell, for uh, Dr. Campbell, ironically. And uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Moo, feel free to jump in afterwards I will now. if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Go first. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Campbell. This is also related to the question of resurrection in two parts. Uh, first, do you agree with the assertion that Jesus was vindicated in his resurrection? And if not, why not? But if so, then why is it not the case that since we participate in Jesus' death and in his resurrection, that we are not also vindicated or to use another word for that, justified. Yeah, I don't have a problem with Jesus getting vindicated um, in his resurrection, but I don't think that's what the word is actually saying. I think he is being resurrected, i.e. he's being raised in a new body, free from sin, free from death, free from flesh, free from curse, um, free from Adamic reality. Um, so, I don't have to worry about your second entailment, right? Yeah? So, you're saying no to the vindication then? No, no, I'm not saying no to the vindication. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy, I'm perfectly happy for Jesus to be vindicated, that doesn't bother me. I, I'm actually quite happy to be vindicated myself. Um, not just in debates on justification. Um, I, th I think vindication is important, I just don't think that's the main message that's being delivered. Right? There's a, there's a difference there, right? You see, that you've created a problem for yourself Christologically, because is it the case that Jesus is otherwise going to be judged? I mean, does he have a problem with the Father, uh, which he needs to be vindicated from or justified from? Am I allowed to respond to that yeah, yeah, question? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess uh, the problem is created uh, by the Jewish expectation that resurrection is associated with judgment. So Daniel 12, the resurrection to life at the face of judgment, even Jesus' own words in John chapter 5, that those who have done good will be resurrected to life. Uh, so the association between judgment and resurrection is already firmly in the Jewish mind, it seems to me. Yeah, you're quoting the Jewish text selectively. There's a debate over this. Different Jewish texts understood resurrection in different ways, and so did different groups of the Pharisees. Some of them felt that there would be a resurrection and you would face a judgment scenario. Some of them felt that it was just good to get resurrected, 
Like, that was good. If you made it into the... Blessed are those who will eat at the table of the, res- of the righteous and the resurrection. If you make it there, that's a good thing and everybody else just kind of smoulders and turns into dust and ashes. I think the New Testament is, is working with both those ideas quite a lot of the time. Um, but don't let your treatment of Jewish texts from the Second Temple period evacuate... Paul's account of what resurrection means for Christians on the basis of experiencing what happened when someone was actually resurrected, right? We've got to get our information about resurrection from the one who was resurrected, not from what we thought was going to happen before it happened, right? Yeah, is that fair? Okay. Who's your question for? Neither one of them has to jump in, actually. It's kind of for both of them. Okay. Um, So uh, you both mentioned a little bit about epistemology, the acquisition of truth. And my question pertains to uh, pre-conversion, post-conversion. If there is a transition for the nature of epistemology for the believer as opposed to the non-believer, and how uh, we might through the illumination of the Holy Spirit mm. and the, uh, depending on your personal view of identity, whether you believe in a single or dualistic view of uh, the Holy Spirit within a person uh, competing or not, um, what you would, uh, what your particular epistemological views are uh, post-conversion and how that might uh, contribute to this particular discussion? Mm. That's way above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> I guess I would only say that I fully endorse Douglas's concern to say that we, we, we truly recognize who we are before God only after our conversion and mm. only after the Spirit begins to set our thinking straight. Uh, I have no problem with that at all. And I don't, again, see that as necessarily tied into the topic of justification, which we're talking about this evening. So I think that's, I'll just say, say that. Yeah, I don't think we need to specify too aggressively what the pre-Christian distinction is in epistemological terms from the post-Christian, because it simply is the case. It simply is the case that once we're in Christ and open to Christ, which I think can only happen through the power of the Spirit, that is our definitive truth criterion. From that moment onwards, that, that person is sovereign over the process of truth. So we simply, from that moment, as disciples, try and discipline and bring all our thoughts and our thinking captive to him and to this God. Um, and this makes too much concern about that prior situation just a little irrelevant, in a way. We, we do our thinking out of our Christian place, so we don't have to worry too much about what we were thinking before we came there. It's like the addict saying, I need to go back and reconstruct what it was like before I got off drugs. Why? <laughs> just stay off. <laughs> That's kind of what you need to do, right? Am I hearing what you're after, or are um, you, you, I guess you're raising could, a slightly different concern? Maybe I could clarify. Uh, you earlier mentioned the idea of rationalist, uh, rationalistic belief mm. and mm. how that's uh, contributing to the understanding of justification, mm. Mm. Uh, in which, uh, since we're here discussing it, all mm. as believers, mm. I'm not sure why that would enter into uh, the discussion since Paul's coming at it from a post-conversion Experience. Yes, yes. Okay, you're, at, you're on my side, but I think you've created a problem for Doug. Yeah, and that's why I'm asking both of you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not entirely buying this distinction between perception and reality in Romans 1 to 3. I think that we're held accountable according to the standard reading. We're held fully accountable, and that means we're held accountable because we know. I think Romans 1 starts off with a um, pretty strong statement that we're without excuse. Uh, the, the text says we're without excuse because what could be known about God is plain. It's plain from the cosmos. We turn away from it. We're held, they're held accountable. And then, of course, the text turns on us and we're held accountable. So I think perception is part of it. Um, and I think, yeah, I think as soon as you invoke the Holy Spirit, 
in conversion strongly, you are problematizing that reading. I, I want to invoke the Holy Spirit very strongly in conversion uh, and the draw that comes from the Spirit. So, so I don't need Romans 1 to 3 to mess people up. They're already messed up. Mm. Let me just, just, just add then, to, uh, as you've clarified your mm. uh, question there, yes, the, there is that element in Romans 1 to 3, obviously, about what can be known about God has been revealed, mm. manifest mm. to them. They are without excuse because they turn from the knowledge that's there, but I still would, would want to argue that that is not tied to the traditional understanding of justification, which requires only that there be a particular kind of human problem to which there must be an answer that is given in God's justifying verdict. And I would, I would argue again that, that neither the, 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 the text of Romans 1 to 3 nor the logic of the theology requires that people have a perception of their problem in order for justification to stand as an important soteriological part of the picture. I'm, I'm kind of confused now. Um, is Romans 1 to 3 delivering justification or not? Romans 1 to 3 is one, and I would disagree with you about the only, one of the texts that do mm. uh, unpack the significance of but justification. But not here, yes. not on this issue. So I'm, you're going somewhere else. On what issue? Well, you said that justification's here and Romans 1 to 3 is here and they're not lining up on this, this particular no. question of epistemology. Oh, no. They are. No, I think they are separate issues, though. They are not tied together by Paul oh. in the, the logic. In other words, the conclusion he draws yeah. that, that, that requires the response of justification in 321 and following mm. is the reality that all humans are under sin. Right. Whether but they, they realize it. that or not, whether they perceive that and understand its right. significance is but immaterial the, to the reality that people are under sin and yeah. are unable, yeah. therefore, to find a yeah. righteous God by their own yeah. efforts and therefore require the good news of God's justifying act in Christ on their behalf. Yeah, but like, the text says that they know. <laughs> I mean, Romans 1 says that they know. It says a lot of things, but those aren't necessarily entailed in justification. So, so is Romans 1 delivering justification or not? Romans 1 to 3 as a whole is an important text that teaches justification. Does every single verse and every single right. point Paul makes in 1 to 3 yeah. clearly related and required for justification? No. Oh. Okay. It would seem to me that you would need knowledge to be culpable. Otherwise, it's unjust. And it would seem to me in terms of Old Testament stories and procedures, you would always have knowledge. Like, I, I don't, I'm, I'm just not entirely convinced. But, but so <laughs> how is it possible for there to be rational or realistic knowledge of Israel's situation before and outside of Christ? Wow, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to help you out. I mean, <laughs> the Old Testament provides these concepts that um, are filling out this forensic notion, but it seems to me you're abandoning the text, but, but hanging on to the doctrine. So I'm, I'm just a little bit confused. It might not be, it's not the first time that's happened. Well, the uh, people online are screaming out to ask a question uh, here, to okay. interject. Uh, I have one for- Are they uh, from Australia? <laughs> Dr. Not Moo? Not any questions from Australia. I think it's, uh, I think this question from online, a clarification question is kind of the flip side of a similar coin here. In what way, uh, Dr. Moo, do you understand the revelation of Christ revealing the sin problem in a new way? Partly, of course, Christ as one who lived the perfect life becomes, in a sense, the model of what it means to live for God wholly, devotedly, and perfectly. And we compare ourselves in contrast to him and find ourselves uh, very significantly falling short. Uh, the coming of Christ also obviously unleashes the spirit who uh, is uh, that, that uh, person uh, of the God ahead himself indwelling us and providing us with a, a new ability to understand things as they really are. Again, I go back to the point mm. that Douglas made there very mm. strongly and I have no problem with that uh, emphasis on the noetic effect of sin and the way in which the spirit uh, enables us to overcome that problem. Not perfectly in this life, of course, but considerably. I have another question here. This comes from a Chris Tilling for Dr. 
uh, Campbell. Uh, Dr. Mu said that you uh, were diminishing the role of Romans 1 to 4. How, does, uh, how do you respond to this? Ah, yes, that is a good question. Yes. Um, well, I don't think I am. I like Romans 1 to 4. I just see it doing different things theologically. I actually see two things going on, uh, Romans 1 through 3. Um, obviously, I read that Socratically. That's an incredibly important theological moment. Uh, what do we do when we know the truth is Christ? Um, this has been revealed to us, and we're in dialogue with people who are not acknowledging that truth. They're located in other discourses, other truth claims. How do we connect with them? And what Paul is doing there is he's saying, if you step into that discourse that's an alternative and embrace their truth claims, you deny your own truth. You deny the lordship of Christ. This is a very bad idea. Don't do it. So how do I connect with them apologetically? Socratically. You get in there, you understand their location, which you should be doing as a good missionary anyway, and you unpack it on itself and you break it down. And I think this is exactly where Paul is going in 1 Corinthians 1. Theologians of glory, scholars of glory, they need to get a little bit of Socratic action going. And, and this, is, this, this can be a salutary experience. So I think it's an incredibly important uh, part of Paul's gospel. This is where we see Paul, um, in a way, it is most brilliant. The second half of Romans um, 1, to 4, uh, 1 to 4 is, of course, 3 to 4. We get this magnificent exposition of faith. And faith is what Paul targets as, and we haven't talked about this very much, but it's very important. It's assurance. Uh, we need to be confident that we're on track for glory. We need to be confident that this is not pie in the sky, that we really are resurrected. And the way we get that is when we have the mind of Christ, which is a faithful mind, like Abraham's mind. And the way Paul develops that is in terms of resurrection. The end of chapter 4 is a chapter that commentators often struggle with. And the story that Paul tells there is Abraham has promised a conception, a birth, when he's a very old guy. He's 99. His wife is 84. She's not going to have kids. He's not going to have kids. Heck. And yet God says, I will give you a son. And creates life from the dead in Sarah and Abraham. And Abraham's faith does not waver in unbelief. Now, that's the faith we're meant to have, which means... It sure as heck isn't up to you or me. This is something that has come from the Holy Spirit. This is the mind of Christ. But if we have that faith, we know we're participating in Christ and we're on track for glory. So, so they're very, very important texts uh, for me. They're just doing slightly different things. I, I don't know that we would be very far on that one, would we, Doug, um, in terms of faith? Nice, vigorous account of faith. You would like that? No, I'm happy with what you said about yeah, faith. Yeah, great. Thank you. Good. That's good. We're making progress. I, I have a question here regarding the potential or real contradictory nature of your positions. I know when I read my summaries of your positions to my class this morning, my logic class, they felt like there wasn't a real contradiction here. And so one person asks, why argue for either forensic or petitionist view? Why can't both be integrated together and live harmoniously? Well, they can. Pardon? They can. Uh, they can, provided that the account that you give of the forensic, forensic is participatory. <laughs> <laughs> but that's very important. Uh, the filial metaphors drive the forensic metaphors, not the other way around. Yeah? Now, I, I am afraid these are just irreducibly different discourses. Either the forensic is calling the shots and God is like, Congress, you know, God forbid. Okay? We do not want God to be a politician, fundamentally. We want God to be a father. That's what we want. We, we need to fold the forensic into that. So, yeah, good question. Good, well spotted. I, I'm happy with that. But yeah, I, I think there is something of a difference, whether we call it as, as strong as a contradiction or not. Um, Obviously, Paul operates with both the forensic categories and the participatory, and sometimes right next to each other. Uh, Christ died for all, therefore all have died. Um, that moment in 2 Corinthians 5 where you have them 
cheek by jowl. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a long-standing issue in Paul's theology about exactly how you resolve those. Uh, I would, however, want to argue that on the whole, when Paul is talking about the need to pay for the penalty of sin, the uh, debt to God we have incurred by our failure to live to his righteousness, the forensic categories, Christ died for us, dominate. Whereas when he is talking about the liberation from sin and death, which is an equally important part of the Gospel of Paul, the participatory categories begin to become very significant. So to some extent, and I wouldn't want to drive, 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 drive a very neat line between the two, to some extent it seems to me in the theology of Paul, the forensic is tied to this matter of justification, our standing before God, that is secured by the alien righteousness of Christ on our behalf, whereas our participation in the new life of the new age, with all of that means about our conquering of sin and ultimately death, involves uh, continuing participation in the reality of Christ's death, resurrection, and of course, the life of the Spirit. I'm gonna disagree with that a little bit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you supplied a different account of the forensic and you immediately went back to the contractual account, and then you introduced the punitive dimension. Um, I don't see Paul committing strongly to punitive metaphors. I see liberational metaphors. Don't have a problem with that. But in terms of explicit payment metaphors, what, what, what texts are you particularly banking on there? Um, well, obviously there's a great deal of discussion about Romans 3.25. I take that to be a place where Paul talks yeah, about yeah, God yeah. presenting Christ mm. as a sacrifice of atonement akin mm. to the Levitical sacrifices of mm. the Day of Atonement of Levitical 16, but then in which punitive. there is this punishment mm. of the animal sent off, mm. and of mm. course one sacrifice and one mm. sent off, and Christ now is the one who takes that role mm. and indeed bears in himself, as I view the text then, yeah. the punishment due to us. So. Uh, one place among many others, it's not the only, that I think the, the, the punitive uh, idea uh, mm. Mm. is part of the way Paul thinks about the mm. atonement of yeah. Yeah. Christ. I mean, one of the questions I would like to ask you, mm. Douglas, along these lines, might, why did Christ die? Oh, yeah, well, great. So help okay, me first with of that. all. <laughs> first of all, <clears throat> I don't think the Help me with the atonement. Temple, yeah, okay, happy to. Um, the atonement is, the death of Christ is absolutely vital. Um, he had to become like us so that we might become like him. So the, the problem for us is not that we step out of line and need to be punished. The, po the problem is much more radical than that, and that is that we are constructed of flesh that has been invaded by evil, and it lives in us. So what we need is not punishment. We need a new operating system. We need to be recreated, reconstituted. And so Christ comes and assumes what we are and dies, so it's terminated, so that by participating in him, this evil constitution is, is executed. And then we're resurrected into a new, into a new life. So it's a, it's a very radical um, solution, very radical. The, the legal metaphor for sin is too weak at this level. We, we require radical, radical transformation. So, so the, the death of Christ, incredibly important. But of course, it doesn't get us anywhere without the resurrection. The resurrection is saving as well. Got a, not, not too good to be terminated and annihilated and lying there forever. You, you need something on the other side. Vindication, I think Con would say. All right, we're running low on time, so I'm gonna ask for the uh, last question. Great, my question's for Dr. Campbell. Thank you for your presentation, I really enjoyed it. Um, as you kind of describe justification being basically a sanctification process and kind of compared it to the illustration of an alcoholic with the 10-step plan, how on your thinking through it do you avoid the conclusion that on somebody who would do that and get saved would have room for boasting? Um, why on that view, it seems to me that that person, mm. they made it yeah. through the 10 steps, yeah. rather yeah. the other person didn't. Yeah. Um, it mm. seems like there'd be a place for boasting, which seems to be what Paul is against. <clears throat> Yeah, um, it, it's because my understanding of human agency is, is informed by Christology. So what I'm really presupposing in all of this 
is that the Holy Spirit in Christ is creating, creating an effective capacity and agency in us, and we're responding to that. So everything we do, every act we undertake as an act, is a gift of grace. Um, now, I think we freely obey grace, but I think in terms of actual concrete positive righteousness, we need Christ within us, like laying down the railway tracks that we can roll along. So if you ask me if I've ever achieved anything positive in and of myself as a fleshly person, I would have to say no. I would say no. I would say everything that's ever happened through me, around me, is an act of grace, a, a gift of God. And it's, it's incredibly important to preserve that. That is a, a crucial in, insight from the Reformation that we must hang on to with blood and tears. Uh, because as soon as we let go of that, um, we've opened the door to Pelagianism. And, and Pelagianism is a big problem. Marcionism's a problem. Legalism's a problem. Pelagianism's a problem. So, so thank you. Excellent question. Excellent question. It seems to me that uh, just, I, I heard you talk about assurance. You took mm. it on head on. I don't, my limited understanding of theology would say that, you know, Wesleyan tradition wouldn't be that, you know, secure on I'm a assurance. kind of an amateur Methodist. I'm a bit of a mongrel. <laughs> But I, I, I guess my lingering question I have is really a practical one. Um, mm. When somebody converts and they believe in Jesus, they have assurance. One, one, would, one would hold one would hope so. and if they're justified before God. Yeah. Yeah. Could you give me one last rendition of why, that's, why assurance is actually an important part of your theological outlook for Paul's view? Well, one of the things we're delivered from is introversion and narcissism. Um, and God doesn't want us wandering around worried about ourselves. God wants us turned out towards the rest of the world. There are people out there that need help. Uh, we're the ones that are supposed to help them. And unfortunately, we have generated theological models that have created such anxiety that we've got classrooms full of anxious Christians that aren't really confident that God is working in their lives and able to work through the lives of others. So. I really do encourage my, my students, I mean, you know, Doug and I will be right on the same page here. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. You're, you're there, bro. Um, stop worrying about yourself and get out there and visit some prisons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we have hit the nine o'clock hour. I want to, can we give them a round of applause for the people? Thank you. Thank you. Good job. That was fun. That was fun. Thank you.